As we retell this ancient story, let us remind ourselves of those people around the world who are living this story today, struggling to overthrow oppressive dictators and establish more democratic societies. But was it the night from Pesach on this from all the night began to you? Sid Topol's parents were both born in Poland when it was part of the Russian Empire and joined a large wave of Jewish immigration from the shtetls to the U.S. in the early 20th century. They first settled in New York's Lower East Side, where as a teenager Sid's mother worked in the needle trade. His parents met in New York, but were drawn to Boston by cousins who were in the fruit and produce business. They married and eventually settled in the Columbia Road area of Dorchester. Sid was born in 1924, the youngest of four siblings. He remembers how the Depression affected his father's business. So my father got in the fruit and products business in uh, post-World War I, okay? And the 20s were very, very prosperous. I mean, people were prosperous. People had money, people had jobs. And my father built up a good, a very good practice and was doing very well. He bought a house. We had a car, he had a truck, and then he bought two houses next door. One was a two-family house and one was a three-decker, so we had three houses. And so in the 20s, my father was doing well. But then the 30s came along, and suddenly one-third of the nation was unemployed. And people couldn't pay their bills, couldn't afford, okay, they couldn't pay their rent. And so my father was a, was a good guy. A lot of people were on credit. Sid was recognized as an outstanding student and was chosen to attend the prestigious Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in the United States, known for its rigorous curriculum. I got into Latin school, had nothing to do with my family. I think it was my teachers. I, I was a good student in grammar school. I, I, I actually got a double promotion. I mean, I skipped the fifth grade. I went from the fourth to the sixth grade. In those days, I mean, there was no mentoring, no discussion. You either passed or you failed, and if you failed, you were out. And I think only one-third of the kids who started Latin school got through. In its early incarnations, Boston Latin was exclusively the domain of Boston's elite, but by the 1930s, the ethnic makeup of the school was transformed. It was originally a very uh, Brahmin Yankees. They, by the time I got there, had all moved to Weston and Dover. So when I got there, it was Eurocentric. A lot of Irish Catholic kids, a lot of Italian kids, and a lot of Jewish kids, very few blacks, very, very few blacks when I was there, very few Hispanics, uh, but it was kids from uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, and uh, we got along fine. Sid's time at Boston Latin was formative. The rigorous curriculum instilled in him the traits of timeliness and attention to detail that would stay with him throughout his life. For college, Sid decided to leave Boston for Amherst and the University of Massachusetts. My attraction was, uh, I had this idea I liked to live away from home, you know. Most, most of my colleagues were, like we commuted to high school, they commuted to Harvard or Tufts or BU or BC and, and lived at home. I, I was fascinated with the idea of, of uh, living away from home. At UMass, Sid planned to study chemistry, but a pivotal historic moment forever altered the direction of his life. Uh, I arrived at, uh, at Mass State College in September of 41, a 16-year-old kid that just graduated Boston Latin School. In December 7th of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Sam Glass and I were playing ping pong in the basement of Lewis Hall, and we had the radio on for some reason, Sunday morning, and we hear about it. I mean, it was a real shocker. And so I decided, I, I thought about, you know, what am I going to do? And I heard about this uh, meteorology program, 
And uh, I applied. I think it was in Chicago. And uh, uh, got accepted. Sid was inducted into the Army in 1943 and underwent an intensive two-year training at Michigan, Yale, Harvard, and MIT to become a radar officer. He clamored to see action and was sent to Japan, where he witnessed the post-war devastation in Tokyo. Yeah, he got, got to Tokyo, burned to the ground, burned to the ground. Three buildings, the Daiichi building where MacArthur was, the Imperial Hotel designed by Frank Lloyd Wright to withstand earthquakes, and a building called the Tokyo Electric Building, which just happened to be an office building that was built fairly strong. The occupation which I was involved in from probably October and November of 1945 to June of 1946, about seven or eight months, was just an interesting experience of taking a country that had centuries of militaristic and autocratic and undemocratic uh, culture was being converted to a democracy. The Japan experience had a long-lasting impact on Sid and influenced his future work in nonviolence. I had a strong military training and background and, and, and mindset in the days of fascism, in the days of Stalinism. And uh, slowly over the years, uh, me, like a lot of other people, realized that we're not, we're not accomplishing anything with wars. Vietnam War particularly was a disaster. And the Iraq War, pretty bad. And even these Gaza Wars, I mean, you know, having to... And I started to learn that diplomacy and nonviolence have had some successes. Gandhi in England, he threw off the yoke of British colonialism. Mandela in South Africa, a man who started out being fairly violent, came out of prison and ended apartheid, but particularly Martin Luther King. John Lewis getting beaten brutally over the head and not fighting back. The kids at the restaurant, sitting at the restaurant with these guys throwing food at them and water and not fighting back. They got the right to vote. They got a little help from uh, LBJ, but it was civil disobedience that, that did it.